Welcome to Health Talk. If you have been diagnosed with congestive heart failure, it's important for you to understand congestive heart failure and how it affects you. We will discuss the importance of weight, diet, medications, and symptoms. With treatment and lifestyle changes, you can make your heart's work easier and help yourself feel better. Today, you'll hear from Dr. Bill Harris, interventional cardiologist, and Leslie Maynard, nurse practitioner and manager of the Heart Failure Clinic. Now let's meet Dr. Harris. Congestive heart failure, huge problem, growing problem in the United States. We probably should start out, what is congestive heart failure? Well, it's very interesting. Actually, several years ago, the American College of Cardiology changed the name of it, that it's now called heart failure. So why did they change it? Well, there's two big components of heart failure. The one that everybody recognizes, and that's why we call it congestive heart failure, is when the patient is congested. And what does congested mean? It means that you just have too much fluid in your system. We use the word volume overloaded, or you're wet, would be the terminology you hear the doctors and nurses say. Well, what does that cause? What kind of symptoms when you have that? Well, one of the earliest symptoms will be just shortness of breath when you do your ordinary activity. You just kind of know that something has changed. I'm just more short of breath. I get tired easier. And then as this evolves, you may find that when you first go to bed and you lie down in the next 30, 60, or 90 minutes, sometimes you'll just develop a nagging cough, a tickle in the back of your throat. You don't know what that is. And if it doesn't get any worse, you tend to go to sleep. As it progresses more, the nagging cough will turn into shortness of breath and a sense of anxiety that you don't think you can get your breath. So you sit up or you get up on the edge of the bed or you go to the recliner or you go sit on the couch and you wonder what's going on with this. And then as it progresses more, you don't even attempt to lie down. You sleep in the recliner. You've got four pillows on the bed and you're getting more and more short of breath. And as it progresses more, you start seeing swelling in your legs and your ankles. Your belly kind of gets bloated. There's a thing that we call early satiety. What that means is that you just take a couple of bites of a meal that you used to eat all the time and you feel very full. And that's due to the fact that you're getting fluid and swelling in your stomach. And so just a little bit makes you feel very full. And then when it progresses beyond that, you may end up calling 911 and coming to the emergency room. It's a progressive problem of being congested. Now the other area that sometimes we don't pay as close attention to is what we call the low output problem, where you're not too wet, not too much fluid, but your heart muscle is not able to keep up with your activity. And that's most commonly associated with increasing fatigue. You just can't do what you used to do. You just tire out, maybe get a little short of breath. And what happens is Mother Nature just all gets us to downscale what we're doing. So you just kind of do a little less and you do a little less. And it's a subtle process to where you find out you're not doing anything. So those are more the low output symptoms and not the congested symptoms. And one of the reasons they changed the name is they really wanted people to think about both sides of the equation when it comes to heart failure. The most common cause of heart failure in this country is due to coronary artery disease. People that have heart attacks and damage to the heart muscle so it doesn't pump as well. And that causes problems with the fatigue. It, when you try to demand more out of your heart, it just can't give it to you. So your energy levels down, your ability to do things are down. And then as it gets weaker and weaker, the fluid starts to pile up and you get the symptoms that I talked about earlier. There's another heart problem and a heart failure problem where the heart muscle looks normal. It squeezes normal, but you get congested. And in that case, the heart tends to be stiff. It just doesn't accommodate even reasonably normal amounts of fluid as well, and you get this buildup of pressure and fluid in your lungs. That's a common problem that develops as people get older. It's very, very common in people who have high blood pressure, particularly if it's not controlled. It's a little more common in women than men, and sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to treat 
than the other problem. It's a growing problem because people are living longer. We're doing a better job of, excuse me, of taking people who have had a heart attack and keeping them alive longer with bad heart muscle. So it is something that is a huge problem for the healthcare system and the patients. But the good news is there's been tremendous progress in the treatment. Tremendous progress in the treatment both from a medication standpoint, both from a device standpoint, both from how do we manage this as you go home. And that is a huge problem with huge benefits that we have good, what we call longitudinal care that you don't actually go see the doctor all the time because it can be done better on a much more frequent basis by heart failure clinics run by nurse practitioners and PAs under the guidance of physicians that look at that whole clinic. So the whole time from diagnosis, therapy, and then how do we deal with this chronic disease on a long-term management is what it's all about in heart failure. And there's developments both in all those categories from the standpoint of devices, medications, and long-term management. I'm Leslie Maynard. I'm the nurse practitioner for the Congestive Heart Failure Clinic at Pikeville Medical Center. Weight is a major contributing factor conge to congestive heart failure. Um, we're going to talk about weight management and how you track your weight to avoid congestive heart failure episodes. One of the most important things in weight management is tracking it on a digital scale every day. The best time to weigh is first thing in the morning when you get out of bed before you've had anything to eat or drink and after you've gone to the bathroom. You need to weigh daily in the same amount of clothes every morning and track it on a weight record. If you notice that you've gained two pounds overnight or three pounds or more over five days, you need to either call your healthcare provider who is managing your congestive heart failure, or you need to report to your nearest urgent care or emergency department. This is an example of a weight record. You can see that it matches a typical calendar, and in every block for the day of the week that it is, you would record your weight in this section. Knowing your ideal weight is key when you're managing your heart failure. So one of the things that you want to tell your doctor is what you typically weigh on a regular basis. As you track your weight, you will want to stay as close to your ideal weight when you are not experiencing weight increase or volume overload. We consider that and we call that a dry weight. When you are experiencing congestive heart failure symptoms and your weight increases, we consider this a wet weight. We want to avoid that. So on your weight record, you will record what your typical dry weight is. And when you see that you are two pounds or more over your dry weight, that will also signal you to call your healthcare provider. In addition to recording your daily weight, you also wanna keep track of your blood pressure and heart rate. As high blood pressure or hypertension is a contributing risk factor to the development of congestive heart failure. One of the things that contributes to raising your blood pressure is your dietary intake, and specifically a dietary intake that is high in sodium or salt. As you can see on this food label, the sodium intake in this container is 490 milligrams. When you have congestive heart failure, you want to maintain a sodium intake in a 24-hour period of less than 2,000 milligrams. The American Heart Association recommends a sodium intake of 1,500 milligrams per day. We like to divide that out in between your meals and snack times and average around 300 milligrams per meal or snack. So as you can see with this label, and the serving size being one, if you ate both of these cakes, it would contain 490 milligrams of sodium. That would be too high, and that would increase the retention of fluid and salt and raise your blood pressure. As you can see, I've picked a variety of some of the most popular foods that we like to choose when we go to the grocery store. And from these items, uh, you can see that by reading the labels that they have a high amount of sodium or salt in them. Some of our most favorite things, like a chili dog, 
a cheeseburger with bacon and processed cheese, very, very high in sodium. Chocolate donuts, sodium intake, 340 milligrams. Orange Crush, drinks that we take in, and this one bottle alone has 120. So if you were gonna have this drink and you wanted to eat, over half of what you could already have was just in your salt intake in a 300 milligram is already taken in by just this one drink. Danishes, bologna, V8 juice. You would think that it's healthy because it's a juice, but actually this one bottle, which is a serving size, has 980 milligrams of salt in it. More than half of your entire intake recommended by the American Heart Association for congestive heart failure. These are examples of bad choices. These choices, if you took in this food even in one day, could bring you in to your local emergency department with congestive heart failure symptoms. I've put together some healthy food choices when you have congestive heart failure. These choices, as you can see here on the table, contain a lot of fresh fruit and vegetables, and they are very low in sodium content. We're going to pick up one right now and read a label again. These are Rice Krispies, and the serving size in this container is one, and the sodium content in this is 100 milligrams. This would be a healthy choice to stay within your 300 milligram mil limit, um, especially when you add in some fat-free skim milk, the sodium content in this whole container, which you probably wouldn't even need, but if you did, you could use, is 130 milligrams of sodium. So the two of these together and throw a banana on would make a really great breakfast choice. When it comes to seasoning your food, you want to read labels and make sure that you're choosing salt-free seasoning alternatives. Mrs. Dash has a variety of seasoning options at the store as they carry 15 different sodium-free alternatives to flavor your foods with. When it comes to canned or processed foods, we usually say no canned soups at all. But there's a little bit of a myth to that. You can see that this isn't the normal size um, of a can that you typically see at the store. It's a smaller portion. Also, the label says that it's low sodium cream of mushroom soup. If you look at the back, this serving size is one container, so that means when you go to the label, the sodium in this whole container is 65 milligrams. This would be a great meal option to have for lunch or dinner. When it comes to choosing uh, salads, you want to choose fresh uh, vegetables or fresh frozen vegetables. Um, are adequate as well that haven't been packed in salt. A lot of your canned vegetables are packed in salt water. If you choose to get some green beans, you need to make sure that you drain them from the can and rinse them before you cook them. When it comes to dressings to put on your salads, you want to make sure that you stick to more of the olive oil or vinaigrette based dressings. This is a fat-free raspberry vinaigrette the serving size is two tablespoons. In two tablespoons, this contains 80 milligrams of sodium. So this would be adequate as a meal to combine those together and stay within your 300 milligrams. Drinks. You want to look for drinks that also have low sodium. You don't want your meal compromised of drinking all your sodium in liquid. The amount of sodium in this vitamin water is zero. So you have not wasted any of your sodium points when you choose to drink this, and that allows you to eat more food and feel fuller. In addition to talking about and looking at the salt intake in your foods, it's important also to look at the carbohydrate intake in your foods. Carbohydrates change to sugar when they enter the body. And a lot of times, when you have cardiac diseases, you also have comorbidities such as diabetes or glucose intolerance. Some of these food choices here are adequate for congestive heart failure patients as well as patients that have diabetes. You want to choose foods that are whole grains, such as the bread, 
uh, the whole grain, whole wheat cereals, as well as fresh fruits and vegetables. If you combine all of your diets with all of the disease processes that you have in your body, you will lead a healthier life and you'll feel better. Here at Pikeville Medical Center, our goal is to keep you out of the hospital and healthy and active in your daily life. It is as simple as the choices that you make in the foods that you eat and keeping track of your weight daily. Well, as you heard before from Leslie Maynard, who's a nurse practitioner that runs our heart failure clinic, that there's many different options, lots of programs and education available at the Pikeville Medical Center to help pe people deal with this chronic illness. They range from diet to medications, and one of my biggest pet peeves is understanding medications. A lot of progress in heart failure. I think we're going to see more and more progress in all aspects of it. As I'd mentioned earlier with medications and devices, home monitoring system, implantable devices, markers that we can follow. For example, Leslie follows a thing called thoracic impedance, which she sees you. It's a very non-invasive test. It gives us a very good idea of whether there's too much fluid in your chest cavity or not. Very good idea of how well your heart is pumping. She follows another blood test called BNP. that can be a very good marker in predicting whether or not the volume is beginning to build up. Because her job is to keep you out of the hospital, to keep you from getting sick. This is preventive maintenance. This is to get you in good shape, keep you in good shape. What's the best way to do that? That is an evolving story, both from testing and laboratory testing and other kinds of monitoring. There's devices out now. Certain people have pacemakers put in, and those pacemakers will have a little electrode on the end of it that does the same thing as the test Leslie does. It'll measure impedance, and it can tell us if you're getting too much volume in your lungs. There's some devices being looked at now that can be implanted in what we call your pulmonary artery that'll constantly give out information about your output and your volume status that can even be eventually monitored on your telephone, transmitted to a heart failure clinic. So the progression of this is unbelievable. And on end-stage heart failure, obviously heart transplant is something everybody's familiar with, but there's not enough hearts to transplant all the sick people. So they're coming up with left ventricular assist device. Those have been proved immensely over the years. And, and not only are they doing a better job for the patient, they're providing more mobility, a better quality of life at the same time. For some people, they represent a bridge to a transplant. For some people, they use them forever. They become smaller, more effective, less side effects, and less restriction on the patient's mobility and lifestyle. So congestive heart failure is a big problem, huge management problem, but has a bright future. Lots of smart people working on this. We've learned tons of stuff over the years, and we've probably only seen the tip of the iceberg. This is something where the ingenuity of different companies making different devices, pharmaceuticals, doctors, outpatient clinics, people with constant observation of patients like Leslie does every day, adding to the wealth of knowledge to improve this. But the bottom line, as we summarize this, is prevention of getting the problem. And just so everyone understands, most of the time, the majority of this is caused by preventable disease, coronary artery disease. How do we prevent that? Control your blood pressure. Don't develop diabetes. Exercise. Watch your weight. Eat properly. For God's sakes, don't smoke. Prevention is the key. Never get this problem. But for the people that have it, great advances, great optimism, and a great future for being able to improve not only the length of your life, but the quality of life in what has been a very difficult and growing problem in the healthcare system. Thank you for joining us for Health Talk. If you have questions regarding congestive heart failure, call Pikeville Medical Center at 218-4818.